at them. Um, and from there, we're going to go ahead and get started with this. Um, please introduce yourself in chat so folks know who's here. Um, off the bat, we're going to be introducing um, the Thunderbird School of Global, mm -hmm. Global Management. Uh, uh, we're approached by them to work on uh, asking for a project to help local communities and our local business community. And uh, we mentioned that we would love to um, have them kind of do some investigation into retail trends, um, especially during COVID-19. Um, and they got it back to us and <laughs> they delivered. Um, it's a fantastic presentation that really covers a wide swath of um, supports, concepts, and tools to be used throughout the COVID-19 season. Um, so I have here, um, we're going to be introducing um, Simon Roca. Um, Simon's been in a, a lot of different positions. Um, everything from uh, working for the Peace Corps um, in sustainable agriculture um, to consulting director at Net Impact. Um, he's gone to school for the Thunderbird School of Management program. And uh, we're really excited to have him on board. He's actually um, live from Panama right now, um, looking for ethical uh, coffee beans, I believe. Is that right, Sam? Um, yeah, coffee cherries. I'm uh, trying to source coffee cherries out here in Panama. Right on. Farmers. And then we also have Alex Simon from the Thunderbird School of uh, Global Management, um, who is the co-founder of a business himself, um, but has also bounced around from a couple of industries and uh, is now going back for his master's from the acclaimed Thunderbird School of Global Management. Um, so this is Alex right here. Alex, if you want to say hi. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Right on. And from there, I'm just going to toss it off to, them, um, to go through their presentation on retail trends. So uh, take it away, guys. All right. Uh, thanks, Jake, for the introduction. Uh, once again, my name is Alex Nagel. Uh, I'm a first year here at uh, Thunderbird School of Global Management, uh, located here in Phoenix. Um, and it's quite the pleasure to be uh, have the opportunity to not only work with local first, uh, but to be here with all you guys today and uh, speak out um, speak about something we're passionate about, which is um, you know the retail industry and um, different strategies to uh, fight against COVID nineteen. Uh, so right off the bat, um, this industry report is designed as a compilation of resources for small business owners, such as yourself uh, within the retail sector. Um, and we're gonna look at things such as consumer shopping trends, uh, tips for cost uh, reduction, um, potential new revenue opportunities, as well as uh, continued growth of digitalization, which is uh, so key right now. All right, so quick is just, we'll go over some stats um, that we found from the AZ Economy website. Um, and local first represents about 500 shops here that are native to the Arizona area. Obviously, you guys are some of them. Uh, we found that the prime sales months are December and March. And um, consumers have been seeing an increase in disposable income, uh, which is an increase from minimum wage in the growing economy. Um, Arizona is one of the fastest growing states with a 1.7 population increase in 2019. Uh, and we found that retail establishments with previously established online platforms um, and e-commerce services um, have been able to have consistent sales during COVID-19. Um, unfortunately, with uh, the lack of tourism right now uh, in Arizona, as well as the rest of the country, um, it has been difficult for some shop owners, you know, not having the same foot traffic they once would uh, for souvenirs or, you know, just walk-ins. Um, and then looking at this more, you can actually see that the aggregate sales for retail down here um, has increased throughout the year. So that's extremely positive. Um, and then the unemployment um, seems to be kind of coming down as well. Um, Arizona in October was about 8%, um, and it's down to 7%, 7.5% most recent. Uh, so definitely a lot of positive outlook here. All right, so digital services are here to stay. Um, so digital services offer unique customer experiences that can be tailored based upon um, you know, corresponding demographics. Uh, not only do these uh, digital offerings offer convenience for customers, uh, they also allow for scalability of services. Retail stores are usually limited by size and capacity, not to mention a labor force. Digitally, however, these bottlenecks are eliminated. And according to a recent uh, survey here by Accenture, um, consumer habits have changed throughout the pandemic, and they expect a lot of these to continue after we finally do get out of it. Um, so I think some key ones here that I like to look at are the increase in social media platforms, um, the in-app ordering or curbside pickup, as well as the company website. And those are some points we'll get to later in the presentation. Um, but those are things you can really do yourself. And I think they're extremely beneficial, you know, just taking your services online um, and offering your products in a, you know, a different way. 
All right, so product availability is key. So studies performed by the uh, McKinsey and Company uh, cite that product availability is a key factor for consumers when consumers are determining when and where to visit retailers. When marketing goods, it is crucial to let consumers know what items are in stock and available. Much like a survey performed by Accenture on the last slide, um, consumers are expecting this to continue on past the pandemic. I mean, you can see in that uh, this, the graph on the left-hand side uh, that 48% of the respondents um, mentioned that products in stock was the number one thing. So once again, back to the social media, your website is you know letting people know whatever good you have is available at that moment. They don't need to wait. Uh, they can just come in and grab it. Um, and then on the right-hand side, um, I'm sure you know we've kind of seen, but things like furnishings, um, like home improvement goods, groceries, all those industries have had a lot of growth, um, you know, during the course of the pandemic, um, and most likely will continue onwards. All right, Simon. Yeah, thank you, Alex. So another trend we've been seeing is the rise of sustainability. So concerns surrounding sustainability have been growing for customers since the beginning of COVID-19. And this has set off a chain reaction from larger companies such as Danon, Amazon, and Lego to accelerate timelines of becoming completely carbon neutral. And though this can be more challenging for a small business, a survey performed by CoreSight Research shows that 29% of consumers now consider environmental sustainability more of a factor when purchasing goods. In another survey performed by Fuchera, it found that 88% of consumers want brands to help them be more environmentally friendly and ethical in their daily lives. So some tips to improve sustainability for small businesses is minimizing paper use and using e-documents when possible, looking into sustainable packaging alternatives like recycled materials or bi biodegradable materials, also sourcing locally when possible, and making the switch to energy efficient lighting. Um, and of course, recycling. Always recycle when you can, try to reduce your waste. So looking at some of the sustainability, pro sustainability programs that Local First Arizona has to offer, there's quite a bit. A really great one is Arizona, the Arizona Green Business Program. And this offers a consulting and certification service that helps businesses reduce their environmental impact. And it also provides recognition to consumers as a green business. And there's also the Southern Arizona Green Business Alliance, and this program works with businesses and nonprofits as well to improve their sustainability strategies. And looking at Scale Up, this one is a seven week workshop and you get to learn from sustainability experts you get, and you get access to low cost, short term micro loans. And the last one we have here is the Good Food Finder. And this is a directory in Arizona that allows for the promotion of local food businesses. Next slide, please. So we're gonna dive into some COVID-19 best practices real quick. So some important ones are obviously to check employee symptoms before shifts. And if possible, if you have the resources to test employees weekly for COVID-19, in addition to providing PPE for employees, including face masks, and also hopefully disposables for customers in case they forget theirs at the door. In addition, we also think it's important to place hand sanitizing stations in several areas in the store, including the entrance and checkout register. And it's always important to remind employees to wash hands, especially after customer interactions. And we believe that companies should also disinfect counters, payment readers, screens, shopping baskets, baskets and other services frequently. And if possible, if Companies can develop efficient curbside or contactless pickup for online orders. That would definitely help. Next slide, please. So let's look at some marketing tactics here. So with COVID-19, I mean, it's obviously been unprecedented. And there's still a lot of uncertainty regarding contracting the virus in different environments. But looking at um, a statement by Mayor D. Marg of El Paso, Texas, he stated that 55% of the positives in that area were coming from shopping at large retailers, what they term as big box stores. So it can be inferred that small retail stores should market this information to their customers because there should be less traffic in their stores and thus the risks of virus contraction should be lowered substantially. So communi communicating the situation with transparency and utilizing up-to-date statistics to mitigate concerns is important to increase consumer interest and demand. 
So this can be done by utilizing client databases to create virtual communities. And that, that will also allow for increased engagement and growth potential. We also think that small retail stores should be increasing their online engagement with customers to keep up with the latest digital trends. So actively promoting new products, promotions, and directly engaging with customers to develop relationships that can benefit retail stores in multiple ways. And if not doing so already, one other thing that retail stores can do is retarget previous customers. This can be useful as brand recognition can improve the likelihood of repeat purchases and initiating conversations using promotional content through email or social media ch channels can motivate these customers to return this to the store in the near future. Next slide, please. So going online, um, with online shopping on the rise, your website has now become a critical storefront and first impressions for uh, customers. It's important to make it as straightforward and user-friendly as possible. So user-friendly websites can increase the connection a consumer feels with the service. And this means creating as symbiotic an experience as possible. It will allow the customer to feel more comfortable it allows for time efficiency, and if done correctly, can enhance their overall relationship with you through website revisits and positive associations. And although creating a website does sound daunting, a lot of us probably don't have programming experience, but there's a lot of platforms that exist now that make it possible for beginner, beginners to sort of create their own websites using pre-existing web templates. So some of these platforms are WIX, which only costs $23 a month, Weebly, I'm sure we've all heard of GoDaddy, which is $15 a month, and also Shopify for $29 a month. So these templates pave the way for inexperienced website creators to quickly harness the latest technology available. In studies conducted by ROI Revolution in November, show that 80% of traditional retailers have seen a significant decline in sales since the pandemic began. Uh, meanwhile, only 22% of direct to consumer companies have noted a decrease. And those are typically companies that are mo more focused on e-commerce. So a new website should create new costs for small retail stores, but it can quickly pay off in the long run. Next slide, please. So here we have some online tools um, here in Arizona. So what is the Shop Arizona Marketplace? Shop Arizona is a one-of-a-kind e-commerce one e site that will showcase unique products art, gift cards, and more from small businesses across Arizona. A shopper can pick out a candle for a friend, a gift card for a parent, and treats for a pet all in one easy website purchase. And to get into this action, there's only one, a one-time setup fee of $100. And as long as you maintain an active membership with Local First Arizona, um, that, that's all you have to pay. So Local First will not take a percentage of sales from any purchases. Instead, they ask the customers when they check out if they want to add a donation during their purchase. And Local First will use that donation to maintain the website, their staff, and continue providing resources to the community. And so what they ask in return is for you to list your 10 best products. So not only do they want you to aggregate your products collectively, but they want to direct traffic back to your website. So start by placing your top 10 selling products on the Shop Arizona Marketplace. And you can have complete control of how to present and price your products. You'll, you'll also be responsible for shipping items, managing inventory and customer communications. But Local First is actively collecting the best resources to provide you with best practices, such as shipping, managing inventory, photographing products and more. So a customer will pay for their purchase and Local First will receive the funds. But then weekly on Wednesday, you will receive a disbursement of the orders that you have marked complete. I hope that was easy to understand. There's a lot. All right, Alex, take it away. All right, thank you. So now that we went over some of those um, online tools provided by Local First, and I, I can say the, the, I think the marketplace is extremely cool. Um, and definitely just looking over some of the products and that I wanna shop on fairly frequently. Uh, but some of these other tools here, um, you can find in other places. And um, I know from having a business myself, I found them extremely beneficial. Uh, so the first one we'll look at our uh, customer relationship management software. Um, so things like Vend and Lightspeed are real-time inventory management tracking. Um, Vend is about $99, but it allows for $20,000 a month in sales. Um, it provides tools to track customer loyalty programs, 
Um, and it has things like advanced reporting for analytics. Um, and that's the same thing with Lightspeed. Um, you know, you can offer point of sale. Um, and I think like the most important takeaway though for these two things is the analytics they provide. Um, you know, once you start selling things online, you can really see where are they going, see trends, um, you know, maybe like click rate through and like where they're actually looking at your products, how many times they go to your website. Um, but yeah, and then look, looking on to email marketing, um, Omnisend and MailChimp. And these are both automated services. Uh, they range, MailChimp, you can, I believe, do free and go up to about 2,000 contacts, um, as well as Omnisend's fairly cheap at $15 a month. And both these are extremely helpful for automating your marketing process. You can set up your email campaigns, um, set which, you know, maybe you set a segment that um, for a specific product type to email them every Sunday um, at 7 p.m. and it will do it for you. And once again, the analytics on this stuff is, it's pretty incredible. It will tell you how many people clicked on it, how many people went to your website, how long they like ended up looking at the email itself. Um, so it's pretty crazy. And then the e-commerce platforms, uh, Simon mentioned Shopify. I think Shopify is one of the probably most user-friendly platforms all around. Um, you can use it from building your website um, to the shipping part of your business, as well as the inventory as well. And Shopify's most basic package is about $29 a month, um, which allows for a couple of users, um, as well as a lot of these analytics that I was speaking about. Um, big commerce is a little more expensive. The, the most basic, basic package is about $50. Um, but once again, it's got a lot of good reviews and, and worth checking out. So next we'll look at some unique revenue opportunities. Um, so partnerships um, with hotels, restaurants and service-based businesses thinking outside of the box. Um, it's nice to attract new customers and now's the perfect time to partner with them. Um, so filling their retail areas with your products and business cards can be a great way uh, to get, attract new customers to your business. So that's, you know, things such as targeting, you know, the local hotel and seeing if you can maybe put some things in their gift shop or uh, just to, um, as well as business cards. Um, cross merchandising uh, to amplify the impact of your new partnerships. Think about uh, co-branding products with them. These efforts will alert their loyal customers to other phenomenal local businesses to support without competing with their fa current favorites. Cross merchandising will also ensure a long-standing relationship with your new partner. To give your customers the opportunity to support your partner's establishment. And then lastly, consignment. Um, and this is another great way to get your product in other stores um, and kind of help generate traffic together. Um, so you create, you know, a partnership or, you know, merchandise synergies through consignment. Um, and a consignment is the arrangement that allows you to place your goods in another store, um, you know, at no cost to yourself until it's sold. And then your partner that you do the consignment with, you know, would take a portion of it as well. But once again, it's, it's about creating those, center, those synergies, um, you know, and helping each other out to try to get as much foot traffic through each other's stores as possible. Um, it's, we looked at who to partner with. Um, so brands with a similar customer base, uh, you might think of them as competitors, but you know, there's a lot of things you may have in common that you can really help each other out with. And then as well as neighbors, um, if you're in a, maybe it's a little more difficult if you're in a freestanding retail building, but if you have stores next to you, um, you know, it's really helpful to drive traffic to each other's stores. All right. So next we'll look at some of the digital opportunities. Um, we spoke about Shopify a few different times here, um, but once again, that's just the e-commerce platform that allows for you to not only list your products, but also build out a website and manage your inventory. Um, FAIR is um, it's a unique website that is great for wholesaling. So they actually have 13,000 unique different brands. Um, and the process with that is fairly simple. It takes about 30 minutes to set up um, and you can set up payments at like terms as well, like up to net 60. Um, so you'll be able to go to that website and sell your products um, in wholesale value to other retailers, you know, really around the country, um, you know, for another potential revenue source. And then Facebook's new shop program. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with Facebook, um, but they're launching, you know, a new platform for small businesses to be able to list their products and, you know, just another marketplace. Um, another revenue opportunity we thought about was shop with a plus one. And um, this is the concept that, you know, even with social distancing procedures in place, 
Um, you know, foot traffic is an extremely critical element to any retail business. Um, so some stores have initiated the shop with a plus one program that is designed to bring more customers to the door. Um, and the premise is essentially that, you know, if a customer comes in with a family member or friends and they each make a purchase above a certain value, uh, that they would receive a discount. And once again, that's just trying to drive more and more people to your store. And then aligning with community initiatives, similar to what Simon talked about, um, but sustainability has been a, a key driver for consumers' behavior. Um, so by aligning with maybe a local charity or a community initiative, you may be able to promote awareness for your company or your brand, um, you know, as well as helping out a good cause. So next we're gonna look at some reducing costs. Um, so the demand and prices for shipping has increased uh, significantly throughout the pandemic as more businesses move online. Um, in August, 2020, the US Postal Service announced a price increase from 24 cents up to $1.50 uh, per good, depending on classification. Um, as, you may, um, as you may see the increase in your e-commerce purchases, um, it's important to do some research on the most cost-effective way to ship your goods to your customers. So the first one we looked at was use, um, using poly mailers. And when calculating shipping costs, both weight and dimensions play a factor with small non-fragile goods. Um, try maybe using these poly mailers instead of the boxes, which lay up, weigh a lot less, as well as take up all, a lot less room in the delivery truck. So you'll have a decreased uh, shipping expense. Uh, utilize discounted supplies. Uh, most shipping carriers such as UPS, uh, UP, at USPS and FedEx will provide small businesses with free packaging um, as an incentive to use their services. Um, you can also try to negotiate a volume discount in exchange for loyalty to one carrier. Um, and then shipping on uh, checking out third party insurance. Um, this is the process. A lot of times U UPS and USPS will provide insurance up to about hundred dollars. Um, and past that it can be quite expensive. But if you look at some of these third party carriers, such as like ship rate, you can sometimes find uh, a generally cheaper rate. Oh. Next, we'll look at, well, I guess some more reducing costs, but so internships uh, with college students uh, home right now in a lot of cases and facing the similar thing as us, um, try utilizing them. Um, so they have a lot of times flexible schedules and are eager for real work experience. Um, so maybe an internship role uh, to help as a social media manager or in marketing uh, sales. And it provides a great opportunity for your store to utilize some of these skill sets that you know, maybe a, the younger generation has, um, as well as, you know, additional work capacity. And then they're also able to get some experience as well. Um, store hours, uh, both large and small retailers across the country are reducing hours uh, to not only stop the spread of COVID-19, but also reduce operational expenses that a company just being open. Um, it may be beneficial to assess foot traffic and make challenging decision to cut back by an hour or two to save on payroll, electricity, and other associated costs. And then lastly, cutting back on those subscription services that hit your credit card every month and you might not always be thinking about. Um, so we often overlook them and you know, it might be time to downgrade to a basic membership or temporary pause that service, uh, or maybe just cut it off completely. And some of these could include your landline phone, uh, lowering the internet speed, um, cut out in TV or in store TV or music service, in Spotify. And I know Cox can be extremely expensive. Um, and then once again, downgrading those sales platforms, um, you know, the basic plans at Shopify are 29 versus 79. Um, and then maybe even eliminating some special applications that you're just really not able to fully use right now. And that's all we got. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you very much. And thanks, Alex. I really appreciate it. And, uh, and I just want to accentuate um, kind of some of the things that they talked about, um, because I feel like sometimes um, it can be like, yeah, that sounds great. But a lot of our members have actually initiated a lot of things that are in line with it, what they're talking about. Um, I know I talked to a preschool yesterday along with a yoga studio, uh, and both people um, quickly transitioned everything to be digital and online and really tried to keep their customers that they already had very in line with what they were doing. And both of them saw about a 60% retention rate of customers 
um, to a digital platform to be able to continue like having um, interface with them. I know a, a studio in rural Arizona um, hopped to doing uh, virtual dance lessons um, and, uh, <laughs> and he, he was 80 years old and he jumped on the Zoom and uh, really just controlled it and really um, was able to um, continue that going. Um, with the convenience, um, we, we see a lot of really um, beneficial things with local pickup. We have an option for our local First Arizona store, along with like Bellina 19 and a couple other um, businesses in the Phoenix area offer, yeah, you can have it delivered to your house, but you can also just come by the business and pick it up. Um, and that has reduced some of the costs for those individuals. Um, I know that uh, making sure that people know that things are um, purchasable, um, poor little rich girl kind of um, went off on that. Um, they posted to their Facebook uh, various outfit um, combinations so that people knew it was in constantly on the go. Um, the cross promotional concepts that um, Simon and, um, and Alex were talking about is one of the things that LFA really tries to support and loves the best. Um, we see uh, Tracy Dempsey um, paired with some produce and you can pick up um, that uh, community supported agricultural bag of produce from Tracy Dempsey. But she also had on consignment a ton of other products that you could get um, from bread to eggs to all kinds of things um, so they're reaching different demographics that maybe they wouldn't have reached before. Um, Genuine in Central Phoenix is doing the same thing. You can be a wine club member, but they also send one Arizona made product with their wine every month. Um, so they've been trying to build different relationships with different people um, to get a product in front of people who might not have been, it would, it might not have been in front of people before. Um, what they were talking about sustainability is great. Um, sustainability is also um, a marketing campaign. It's how you tell people you care about your state. Um, that's the same with the COVID protocols. And we've seen that um, the more people market it, their best practices in COVID and their best practices in um, sustainability, um, the more profound um, customers are and the more they want to come in. Um, one of the cool things that you mentioned was reducing some of the costs of the building um, and limiting hours. I know a couple venues in Tucson have taken it upon them to measure right now um, what an empty building is like for cost, just for a comparative analysis so that they can kind of realize that they can save money by doing certain things in their facility. So they're kind of tinkering um, with their numbers and paying attention to their facility a little more um, to be able to figure out where they can save a little bit more money. Um, the internships, I talked to someone yesterday who um, is designing a marketing position that pays a little bit less, they're doing a stipend um, so that they can still provide a value to that intern, um, but that it's much less than getting a service or, or paying an actual marketing position. Um, so a lot of concepts um, that were talked about today in this presentation are very relevant and we see them pretty routinely um, with our businesses, business members. So with that, I would like to um, introduce Brian of, uh, of Brian and Lori. Um, from Motor Palace Mercantile. Um, they opened the Mercantile around around two years ago, um, and they sell merch, milk, and much more. Um, I know you guys have a crazy background. I know that Lori is a, a famous television photojournalist, and you're a third-generation motorcyclist from, uh, with a 25-year career at Harley-Davidson, um, which means I'm sure that Winslow is a fantastic place to settle um, with that hobby. Um, but I know you talked about um, a big change um, and that you, uh, you opened up this Merc and, uh, and you ride, um, but now you're kind of known as the milk people in Winslow. Um, so how did that come to be and how's business going? Well, uh, first business is going really well. Uh, I want to make one little correction. Uh, we actually started uh, right before the pandemic. Our our grand opening was scheduled for late February. And we did a sort of a soft opening um, around November or something. And then Lori went away for about a month to go fishing. And because we were retired officially, is what we were doing. Anyway, um, when, she, uh, when she came back, uh, she said, ah, it's Christmas. You know, we'll have the doors unlocked, kind of people come in. Uh, anyway, so then the pandemic came and uh, we slowed things down real quick uh, as far as uh, 
being open. But um, now I forgot your question. <laughs> so how's business right now and how did you become the milk people? Ah, uh, yes, yes. Oh, yeah. Well, we, like I said, we were going to open a, a store. We weren't sure what we we're going to do. We could, motorcycles are going to be part of it. Um, clothing, made in America products, actually. Uh, we we're focusing on uh, products made in USA. Um, and it's normal things you use, though, not, you know, weird things sometimes you see in these made in USA sites, but um, actual things that, you know, people wear, clothes, uh, stuff like that. And, um, and we had uh, snacks and things uh, for, as travelers on motorcycles and in cars and stuff, we've done a lot of traveling and we, we don't usually eat fast food. Uh, we, don't, we don't eat fast food. So we, we want healthier alternatives to things you see um, in the stores, uh, things like that. And then again, with it, when the, so we already had the food. So when the pandemic came, we were able to kind of shift into more food and, and more home food. But the milk was really because Lori uh, has some food sensitivities. So she has to drink, you know, pure milk and pure cream and stuff like that. And she likes cream. She loves her cream. And uh, anyway, she contacted Dan Zeissen to see if we could sell the cream because she was going to do truffles for Valentine's. And they invited us down. They're a great bunch of people. And uh, we did it thinking we'd sell maybe, you know, a dozen bottles a month or something. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, when the pandemic hit, somebody, there's a couple of people choked around about delivering. And next thing you know, I'm delivering milk. And uh, I'm the milkman. And all the kids in town, <laughs> I know where everybody lives. All the kids in town see me and know me. I'm, I'm the milkman. And it's, it's pretty fun. It, it's, it's a lot of fun. So you kind of started with this uh, uh, motivation to start a business and uh, it was kind of going to be kind of tourism and, and some items and some food too. But then when the pandemic hit, you noticed that there's a completely different um, base that kind of needed something um, and started coming in. Right. Correct. So I, I know, I know one of we, we talked about three things the other day and one of them is that um, uh, for just trends and things that you would recommend is that um, you would very much um, you talked about, that consumers can sometimes come from a weird place and that the people you expected to come in weren't the people that came in. Can you kind of expound on that? Yeah, it's, um, it, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's kind of that way in a lot of things, but where we really saw it here is especially, we really anticipated doing a lot more with the motorcycle riders that come through Winslow's a, a, a must stop if you want to call it that. And, um, uh, for people doing the Route 66 deal, and uh, motorcycle traffic uh, fell off pretty quick, and it really our store, when it's said and done, doesn't look like a, anything to do with motorcycles. <laughs> it just it evolved that way, and um, as Lori was doing the you know the design and development of it, and having the food. Uh, we started having more people interested in the food and more locals. And originally when we started, we really wanted to serve about, we were hoping about 70% or so of our business would be local. Because, uh, we didn't want to be dependent on the tourist traffic and tourist trade. And um, actually we've, we're way above 70% now because there isn't a tourist trade. <laughs> so it worked out good. Um, we, but uh, the, uh, so we, you know, one thing we expected to see was a lot of motorcycle riders, uh, as customers and really we were seeing a lot of people that um, just like good food. So it's a real broad spectrum of people, older people, you know, retired, uh, some of them not in great health. So they rely on our de deliveries. Um, they'd have to drive to Flagstaff for some of the things that we have or Phoenix. <laughs> and, uh, which is a great concept because I know we're talking about trends for retail, right? And and one of the trends that you noticed is that um is that it weren't trending and that there is this other customer that was coming in, um and so to target um what you were doing and kind of pivot um to meet the customers that were coming in, right? Correct. Um and to kind of pivot your strategies to um to look at the data and the analysis and who was coming in the door. Um, which I feel like kind of leads to the next kind of conversation where you were talking about rather than just like blanket marketing and trying to get people in that you wanted to look at 
who is coming in and then target to those people to target to the to the people uh you were kind of talking about your past career too that the targeted marketing is gonna kind of come up with more than just a blanket uh effort right yes absolutely and it, that's the funny thing and it was real scalable because the dealership i was at was one of the bigger dealerships in southern california and um uh but even then we focused really on the local local as close as we could consumer and uh an example of that is uh sometimes a you know a dealer uh would sponsor some big event that was statewide even and really if somebody sees that they just see the bar and shield they see harley davidson and they're going to google harley davidson and they're going to find their local dealer so you're doing a bunch of marketing for your competitors really well they're not even your competitors but it's not yours and um so at the dealership level we were really focused on marketing within our territory uh previous customers customers who are similar to our customers and um and that that worked just incredibly well for us and so almost not focusing on who you don't have but focusing on who's coming in the door correct. and who that person knows almost connected to the um to the retail trend that we were talking about the plus one bringing someone in with you yeah yeah, yeah it was the it's a momentum so that, yeah yeah momentum yeah rather than so then we were kind of talking about um, saying one of the number one things that you're doing now too is um, for like Google SEO and for promoting yourself digitally and online and, and in all your marketing campaigns is just to be very honest and thorough. Um, so to, to say what you have and to, um, and to be very thorough in uh, filling everything out. Um, can you kind of dive into that? Yeah, I guess on the SEO stuff, uh, it, it's actually... Um, Again, yeah, it's one of those things is that it's real easy if you just do what Google wants. Google has real clear instructions what, of what they want, what they want to see if you're doing a blog or if you're you know, doing things. And it's small businesses, even at the, the dealership, we, um, we never paid for any um, Google uh, AdWords or anything like that. But we, um, most of our, if you looked at our, our business at the dealership and here, or traffic to your websites. I can't say dollars spent. The conversion's not always um, easy to track, but you get more impressions from Google than anything out there just by doing the basics of what they ask you to do. Uh, phone calls, um, you know, all that type of stuff. Then Facebook, though, is where you can see a real high conversion rate with a direct targeting, you know, target. And then uh, even Lori started, and I'd never messed with this before, but she started a, a, a Facebook group for the store. And it's really, interact, really interactive. Uh, people talk to each other. They talk to us, they talk to her. And those people, um, and you can see your open rates on your emails and stuff. With this, you don't see an open rate, but it's really easy. Lori, well, last week is funny. A customer sent, bought some of our food. She put it together, uh, a dinner for her family with all products from our store, took a picture of it, sent it to Lori. Lori asked her if she could put it on the website or on the, on a, on the Facebook page. So she puts it on the page. And this week when we did our orders, we had one person specifically ordered every single thing that was in that um that one post and other people bought some of the stuff too, but one just bought exactly what it was. And we actually confirmed with the person that, that that's where she got it. And um, so with the, with the, the small businesses, I think the, that group is, it's pretty amazing really. Yeah. You so know, really building, building out that community. And again, it's back to that targeted marketing and knowing who your customers are and engaging with them rather than who you don't have. Yeah, uh, which I feel like is a common thread. I wanted to get to the final one that we were talking about that I really like because it, it definitely connects to the conversation that we just had with the presentation. Um, but we were talking um, about uh, cross promotional partners and uh, working with other people. And I know that you have this new initiative that you might be working on or um, new program or, or um, however you want to describe it. But uh, 
I was wondering if you wanted to jump into uh, uh, doing business with other local businesses and how that's been going. Yeah, actually, that's uh, we're, we're going to be uh, talking to them later today again. But um, it, it, last year, at the we were we were uh, setting up at the farmers market with products um, last summer. And it's only it's freezing here right now. I'm, I'm freezing to death right now, actually. But um, I got a jacket, a sweater, a long sleeve shirt. I'm still freezing. But um, uh, farmers, uh, the farmers market here is only in the summer. And uh, there's a really great farmer or family, a uh, couple uh, that was uh, selling produce and they have a, a farm out there in, uh, by Dilcon. And uh, we were buying our vegetables from them during the summer and a bunch of our customers, we all love these guys, they're great. So uh, anyway, we ended up talking to them last, during the summer about having some of their stuff, you know, if they don't sell it at the farmer's market, We'll sell that at our store uh, during the week, and then also put some of the stuff in our on our orders. Because what we do with our customers, Lori puts out an email, a reminder, and people order from us on the fresh stuff, um, both the fresh stuff and the non-fresh stuff. Uh, uh, on they, they order it, and then that's we deliver it on Thursday. And the milk comes to us on Thursday, then we turn it around. So they're getting really fresh milk that way. And uh, we have some meat, meat products, produce and stuff like that. So we, we get like, we're getting fresh chickens this week for the first time. Um, if you don't get, pick up your chicken by Friday, they're going in the freezer. But right now you know, they're coming fresh. They're organic chickens from Mary's. Anyway, um, so uh, when the farmer's market ended, we started you know, doing their products, putting them in our store every week. And uh, just last week, they hit us up about doing a CSA with them. It would be us and them uh, specifically partner, partnering uh, for this CSA. And like you said about the, um, the uh, what do you call it? The, not upsells, but the extras. We're gonna provide the extras, they're gonna provide the produce, but they'll be bundled already, but they can still buy more of either, you know, if they wanted to add anything to it. But the packages is, you know, they'll have tomatoes. You're gonna have, they're gonna have, uh, mar uh, Sam, uh, San, um, the ones we eat, someone's wife, we eat San something or other, uh, Marzano, uh, tomatoes this year, last year, these great heirlooms, uh, we'll bundle that with some pasta that we sell, stuff like that. Yeah. Which I know, um, I know you were talking about, uh, how, uh, there was a little bit of a hit because, um, the tourism industry is obviously, um, kind of <laughs> substantially down right now. Um, and that you've kind of turned in towards the, the community more than um, you even thought you would, um, which is an interesting part of uh, this cross promotion, because I'm sure some people who used to go to the farmer's market all the time are now customers of your store because that's how they can get it, um, which is a great just example of how cross promotion works. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. And it has worked. So right on. any other uh any other tips for getting through this season and, and what's going on right now that have worked for you? Um, being, being there for the customer. And again, it's easier for us because we're in a super small town. Um, I, I mean, I don't think it's our, our fire this delivery. I mean, we'll go to the next town over for somebody, but uh, mo yeah, most of our stuff, the, I don't think four miles away is probably our farthest customer and there's no traffic. So, um, I mean, Lori's delivered stuff on a bicycle and, um, uh, so it, we, it's an, it's, it wouldn't be as easy to do that in, in a bigger city, of course, but um, you know, we're, we can just hop over to the store anytime. We have our number on the window, on the door. Um, if somebody needs a delivery, we could just pop out and do it, especially with COVID because we're not doing anything else anyway. So <laughs> uh, we look forward to doing deliveries, but um, uh yeah, so really being there for the customer, um, again, watching what they do, uh, looking, see how they've shopped in the past. You know, when you're, when you're asking, a, when you're trying to learn from, you know, they get the focus groups and stuff, you don't have to do focus groups, but, you know, ask your customers what they like, ask them what they're buying. Um, you know, don't ask them to speculate on what they buy if it was there or anything like it, you know, because who knows, but, um, you know, find out where, what do you, what do you got to go, what, where are you either not getting something you want, passing on it or compromising uh, or traveling more than you'd like to? You know, there's different factors that could 
you know, add value. You know, everything you do should really add value to the customer. And think of what you would want as a customer. A lot, all our products are products we, we love. And um, a lot of them we used before. Uh, FAIR, as a matter of fact, you guys mentioned FAIR. It's any uh, retailers out there, unless you're in Winslow. <laughs> uh, FAIR is great. We buy a ton of stuff from FAIR. Um, one of our best selling products um, we get out of FAIR. And uh, they're easy to deal with. It's a good company. Right on. Well, thank you very much, Brian. I really appreciate it. Um, it's good to hear that things are going well up in Winslow. Um, so uh, with that real quick, I would just like to open it up to um, any questions that we may have gotten um, or uh, if anybody has any questions for uh, anyone on the panel. Um, I feel like we uh, revisited a couple themes a lot. Um, one being that cross promotion, um, the other being the focus on what you have and um, what people are buying and what people are interested rather than focusing on um, speculating um, what you could have or what you might want. Um, if you're, uh, if you want to ask a question, you can type it in or you can just unmute yourself and pop in. Um, I did see a question um, from way before from, I think, Brett. Um, but uh, it was about uh, COVID-19 and uh, non-invasive technology being available to do testing. Um, I actually don't have technical information on that, but we have connections that I'm sure I can. So I'm gonna um, figure out an answer to that. But if there's any other questions, go ahead. Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, was wondering if within Local First, is there subgroups that have that that join up like-minded businesses so that you can have these reach out and connections, or um, so you know businesses that truly support each other? Is there any groups like that, or or ways to connect like that? Um, so uh, I have two answers for you. One is um, I don't know if you're already a member of the Local First Business Member Facebook page. Um, it's just for business members and it's for business owners. Um, so it's not like the entire um, Facebook page that we have that's just to the consumer facing, um, but it's actual business members. Um, we try to get people to not necessarily promote on there, but to use it as a tool to ask each other questions, um, to navigate um, things and to just get answers. Um, you can promote yourself in comments too. So if someone's like, I need someone who does this uh, Google SEO, then people can list that they do it underneath it. Um, so you're kind of sorcering locally and, and asking questions. Maybe someone's already been through whatever the problem is that you're um, talking about. Um, the other thing that I have is um, I'm personally trying to create um, some smaller groups of individuals within LFA um, so that uh, like we have a group who are just coffee shop owners who can talk about best practices or um, small mercantiles who can talk about their best practices and kind of build off of each other so that they um, can come up with some solutions um, so I'm working on that. We usually have um, uh, business mixers. Um, those business mixers have obviously slowed down during this time. And, um, and too many Zoom meetings, people just don't want to show up to. Uh, so we haven't done those in a little bit. Um, but our old business mixers used to be at a certain place. Um, and if, the if you're interested in doing business with that kind of theme, then you would come. Um, so one would be like the fitness industry. One would be uh, at a mercantile in downtown. One would be um, at, uh, I know we did one at a pet sanctuary. Um, so anybody who wants to do business with anyone in the pet industry could show up and kind of have conversation and get to know one another. Um, so right now I'm working on some sort of virtual version of that where we can interact and talk, um, but it's in some development stages right now. And this is kind of a first step, this one um, to towards that. Uh, Debbie, we, we, I should get your info and we'll have a conversation after this too um, to kind of expound on that a little bit more. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, I know uh, I'm on the local first, but I'm, I don't know the differentiation between like, I, I, I have to look at it more. I just went in and signed up and that. I'll, I'll get you all logged in. You'll be, in. You'll be good to go. All right. Any other questions? It looks like Dan has a question. Um, have rural chamber of commerce is adapted to get customers to local merchants for the pandemic? 
in Winslow, our chamber is also a visitor center. Brian, are they sending customers your way? Uh, yes, they do. The the um, and so does La Posada quite a bit. Uh, it's actually a wonderful place, and that's why we moved here. Um, but uh, yeah, the Chamber of Commerce does send uh, send people here because uh, customers come in and tell us that. <laughs> so yes. Brian, did you develop that relationship with the commerce or um, did it just kind of happen naturally? That was pretty natural. We joined and, um, and then one of, uh, one of the members or uh, one of the persons, one of the people who works there came in the store and shopped and got kind of excited about it. So they started sending more, you know, I think just seeing it um, helped them. But uh, you know, we didn't, we knew them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> We've been messing around with these buildings for 10 years before we started this. <laughs> so, I feel like I that's a, almost a, a question. A, oh, sorry. Oh, I was just I saying that's a almost a cross promotional uh, conversation. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Go for it, Debbie. <laughs> yeah. I have a question for Alex. I think it was you, Alexander. Um, on one of your screens, you had the um, increase in sales in different divisions, different areas. And one of them was, and my, my particular interest is in the home supply uh, arena, home goods and decor and, um, and vendors who supply that. Where, where, where is that data? I, I went on the AZ Commerce site, economic data site. Um, they don't really call out home supplies. It's just like taxable sales. Yeah. Where would um, I find that? So there's a couple, there's, let's see, I'm going back to it here now. So one of the surveys we got the information from was um, by McKinsey and Company. And that one was more, it looked at um, the different products. You guys, you want me to share my screen back here? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that'd be good. All right. It was one of the blue bars and I think it said like 25. Yeah, the one on the right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this one was from McKinsey and Company. Um, and if you would like, um, I'm sure we can actually get you a link to the case study because it's published on their website. Okay, I'll put my, um, my email in here. Yeah, let me see. Oh. Yeah, no, definitely. I will, um, I will send you over that whole, it's like a, it's a couple page article. Um, but it has um, some more interesting charts as well that you can look at it kind of by industry and some of the trends they performed based off of actually surveys. Okay, and that's and they do hone it down by state. So this is uh, Arizona. I don't Arizona. believe it's by state though. That's the only issue. This is just by kind of the, in the US in general. The AZ oh. economy one, um, you know, if I go back to the, that second slide here, it actually, you, you know what, they might look at it a little more on the retail basis. Um, once again, I will look and I will, I can send you a link to that one uh, from this chart down here at the bottom. Um, Cause I believe they also broke that down into different categories. I don't know how specifically yeah. it is by store, but I knew they had one for like, um, like restaurants, um, like versus- Yeah, tax, I, I saw like taxable sales. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. 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 Okay, thanks. Yeah, no problem. That's great. I'm going to go ahead and say just uh, another thank you to Brian, Simon, and Alexander for, uh, for presenting today. We really appreciate it. If anybody in, um, in this is interested in, in having more discussion about anything that we talked about today, or is confused, or wants a connection or an introduction, because we love to make introductions um, for some of the um, cross-promotion stuff, um, if you have an interest in any of this stuff, you can get me at my email. I just put it in the chat, jake at localfirstaz.com. Um, I can make introductions to anyone who's here right now, along with um, answer some questions or build, bridge some connections as well. Um, so uh, with that, I just want to thank one last time. Thank you so much, Simon, Alexander, Brian. Thank you very much for being here. If anyone needs any other support, please feel free to reach out. Um, Breck, I'm going to get you some information on that COVID-19 stuff that we talked about. And, uh, and thank you guys very much. Have a great day. Thanks. Simon and Alexander, thank you so much. Uh, I've sat in with a lot of consultants over the years and I was technical. The, your presentation, your, your product that you came up with is really valuable. And from what I can see, very accurate. And I'm really happy with it.
Thank you so much. Can't wait to, really can't wait to dig deep. <laughs> yeah, no, we really appreciate that. And, you know, um, on behalf of me and Simon, thank you guys so much for even the opportunity to be here today. So it's, it's great talking with all you guys. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And yeah, thanks for the compliment, Brian. We put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into the report, and we really just hope it's useful for you guys. We try our best. <laughs> it will be. I can't wait to get my hands on it and, and dig in. Awesome. All right. See you guys. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. That was awesome. Have a great day, guys. Bye. 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 Thanks for having us, Jake. Appreciate it. Sure. <laughs>